the Sunset Hills United Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to have you here worshiping with us this rainy, rainy morning. And friends, I am glad that you got out of your warm, snuggly homes to come and be here and to worship with us this day. Beloved in Christ, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God together. Announcements for the benefit of the body of Christ this day. We are going to begin with a joyful announcement. This is not an announcement for the church per se in that what the church is doing, but it's more an announcement for the church family. Kaylee Hepburn, who many of you know as Lila Rose's mom, um, Kaylee is currently in the hospital in labor about to deliver her second child, a little boy. And so I'm sure that at this moment, Kaylee needs all the prayer in the world, but we rejoice in a new life and a new baby about to be born into our church family. Other announcements. Beth Romig, our wonderful um, treasurer who has done so much work in our finance office to do recovery work, well, as of Tuesday, she will no longer be our church treasurer. Because as of Tuesday, Beth Romig will begin as the interim finance administrator of our church. And so Beth will be in the office on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And friends, we rejoice and we give thanks for her, and I think we ought to give her a round of applause. So many thanks to Beth for taking on this job, and also thanks to Mary Abbott, who I believe we have to have a congregational meeting and do everything in decency and order, but Mary Abbott volunteered to serve as our treasurer. Which, yes. <laughs> thanks be to God. The Lord is good. God is good. Also, for the children gathered here this day, you should find two um, bags in your pew. Those are for the kids. Just fun little worship bags, things to, to enjoy. There will be kids group this Wednesday at 4.30 via Zoom as we continue our Lenten study of the last week of Jesus. Next Sunday, March 7th at 6.30 will be youth group. And also, um, information for this week, Wednesday, we are having our second Mission Lent Supper, without supper. So last week, thank you to everyone, we had a great crowd of folks who joined us this past Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We got to hear from Mark Adams and his ministry at the U.S.-Mexico border, and oh my goodness, friends, can I get an amen? Was that awesome? Amen. That was Great. And so this week, we are going to hear from Myra Mann. Myra is a pastor's wife from the Methodist Church. She is the chair of the Pittsburgh chapter of Bread for the World. Bread for the World is a local advocacy organization. They're actually a national advocacy organization, but the local chapter advocates to local politicians for hunger relief efforts in our local area, as well as hunger relief around the world, locally and around the world. They are a Christian organization that was founded by an ecumenical gathering of Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, all coming together saying, let's work together to end hunger. And so we invite you to join us 7 o'clock on Wednesday from 7 to 7.30. Myra will speak, and then 7.30 to 7.45, there will be a time for questions. So I hope you will join us for that. Book Club this month, on March 25th, we're going to meet, and we are reading Father Richard Rohr's book, Falling Upward, a Spirituality for the Two Halves of Life. And I hope that you will um, join us for that. It will make interesting discussion. We are in the season of Lent. And so we prepare for the one great hour of sharing offering on Palm Sunday, which is a special um, Presbyterian offering that goes to disaster assistance both in our country and around the world. And we imagine that some of those funds will be going to Texas to help with the relief effort in Texas. Also, the Future Church Summit. We had five of your session members here over the weekend. For a conference, we were here in the pews with the screen down watching on Zoom speakers. There were over, over 200 churches represented, I believe, from around the, the country and Canada um, watching these speakers on how do we do church 
after the pandemic. Lots of dynamic ideas, lots of peculiar ideas, and a lot of energy and imagination. And so your, your session is, is studying hard and working hard to see how do we hit the ground running following the Holy Spirit in this season and in the season to come. Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Again, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Let us take a deep breath and center ourselves in what we are here for today, the worship of our Lord as we light the Christ candle.
find ourselves living for wilderness experience all over again. You desire our obedience. You are crowded. Yet we crowd you out with calendars jammed with meetings, minds filled with lists and trivia, and hearts filled with worry and care. God of word and silence, lead us this Lent into the deeper stillness where priorities become clear, visions become focused, and your word heard and obeyed. Give us the strength and courage to live this season with open eyes and ready ears. Amen. In Christ we pray. Amen. God, our life and our salvation, does not forsake us or leave us with sin. In Christ we are forgiven and offer the gift of healing repentance. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Barnabas wants to take John Mark along. Who is he to invite another person? I mean, we all know Barnabas. He is the patron saint of second chances. But Paul's problem is that Paul can't get past the grave reality here that John Mark deserted them in the mission field last time. John Mark has no experience whatsoever and has frankly proven himself wholly unreliable. In fact, John Mark virtually abandoned not only the mission field, but the whole calling of the Christian faith. For someone to quit the mission field against the Holy Spirit's callings is tantamount to spiritual defection. So, according to Erasmus, Paul is in the right here. John Mark shouldn't go on the trip. But according to John Calvin, Barnabas is also right. Huh, can he be right? he be right? What does the Bible say about believers like Barnabas and Paul, like ourselves? When we disagree with fellow faithful, believing, Jesus-loving people, what happens when two good people disagree? Well, first, in any disagreement, we need to discover whether we are disagreeing about something essential. We need to figure out, is what we're disagreeing over really worth it? Now, I mean, there are fun disagreements, as we talked about the session yesterday. There's the fun disagreement of whether or not you can actually create a lightsaber. I mean, that, that's a fun thing to disagree over. But those serious disagreements, the kind that we're talking about between Paul and Barnabas today, we need to discern, is this worth it? Note that Paul and Barnabas don't disagree over doctrine. They don't disagree over who ought to be welcomed into the body of Christ. They don't disagree over whether Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. They're not disagreeing over the communion table. So their disagreement is more of a personal problem. Should or shouldn't John Mark go on this missional journey? They're really disagreeing over something personal, something unessential. This makes us ask, what in the church is essential? In every premarital counseling course that I perform, I ask the couple, now you've got to keep in mind, in the first meeting with the couple that I'm about to marry, I always ask them to tell me about their relationship, and they snuggle up to each other, and they're all like doe-eyed, and they talk about how, oh, we just love each other so much. We communicate so well, and I don't buy it. And so, <laughs> so the second session, when I bring them in, what I do is I give them two sheets of paper. They each have a sheet of paper, and they cannot show the other one, and they have to write down 20 expectations that they have of the other in their marriage. Now, I have to tell you, this breaks it all down. Suddenly, that cuddly, doe-eyed couple is sitting on opposite ends of the couch. As they write down, not as they're writing the 20 expectations, but as they're sharing the 20 expectations. Though I have to tell you, there was one couple that I did this with, and their response, they both wrote the same thing. Their only expectation, never change. All right, married people, how's that working out for you? <laughs> right. So, the goal of these 20 items is to see what is essential to this couple that is getting married. And essentials often include, for example, fidelity. Right? It is expected that the spouses will be emotionally and physically faithful to one another. Another essential is forgiveness. Grace. <laughs> it is expected that just as each partner will own up to their mistakes, that there will be grace for the future, right? Every marriage contains those essential expectations. Everything else which way you do the toilet paper? Does it go this way or that way? That, that's malleable. That's malleable. There are essentials. So it is in the faith. In the faith, we have our essentials. Our essential in the church universal, the church around the world, is the Nicene Creed. For over a thousand years, for over 1,500 years, the Nicene Creed is the essential of what we Christians believe. If we're struggling to believe it, we all have our seasons of doubt. If we're struggling to believe it, it's the essential 
of what the community believes on our behalf in our difficult seasons and what we believe other communities have when, when our brothers and sisters are having difficult seasons. It is what we strive by the power of the Holy Spirit to believe. Here we stand, to quote Martin Luther, we can do no other. All of us, 300 plus denominations, yeah, we have our differences. But the Nicene Creed, that's what holds us together. Therefore, when we disagree with our siblings in Christ, we need to ask ourselves, is this essential? Sometimes, you better believe it, it is. Absolutely. But we need to ask that anyway. Is this essentially important? This is the case whether we're disagreeing with an immediate family member who happens to be a sibling in Christ, a fellow member of this congregation, or a member of a different denomination, say, the, the Methodists or the Episcopalians. Is this disagreement over something essential? Or is this something that, in the words of Elsa, can let it go? Second, when we disagree within the body of Christ, we need to ask ourselves, am I being my best self in this disagreement? Is this disagreement edging toward an argument? The scripture today tells us that Paul and Barnabas experience a quote-unquote sharp disagreement with one another. I think there are other translations for sharp disagreement. In the Greek, what we learn is that Paul and Barnabas have a passionate, bitter conversation. And now for those of you who may not remember, this is tragic. Because Paul and Barnabas are like this. They are best, the closest of friends. When Paul is blinded upon experiencing Jesus on that road to Damascus, it is Barnabas after Ananias who cared for him. When all the church at Jerusalem rejected Paul because of his history of literally killing their brethren, Barnabas forgave him. When Paul runs home to Tarsus, it's Barnabas who follows him. When Paul spends three years studying the faith, we call it Paul's seminary years, it is Barnabas who encourages him. When Paul is ready for that first missionary journey, that first time leaving the country, it is Barnabas who accompanies him. This friendship goes back, friends. And this argument is so strong that afterwards Paul and Barnabas never see one another again. It's so sad. Years later, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, quote, get rid of all bitterness, get rid of all rage, get rid of all anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God in Christ forgave you. Paul knows the damage that comes when a Christian disagreement becomes an unchristian quarrel. There is anger. Anger, when left unchecked, leads to words being said that can never be taken back, to decisions being made that can never be undone, to feelings being hurt that leave rather painful scars. Instead of allowing a disagreement, to become an argument, we are called to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave us, especially in the times when we disagree. Third, the Bible calls us to make sure that our position in any disagreement with our fellow brothers and sisters, siblings in the faith, is rooted, is a position rooted in the gospel rooted in the gospel. As with most things in the Christian life, we need to take a look at our motivations. So first, review, we've got to make sure that we're disagreeing with someone over something that's actually fairly important, essential, essential to have this discussion over. Second, we need to make sure that this Christian disagreement doesn't lead to an argument or hard feelings. Just so that you know, this happens in the church sometimes, over crazy things like the color of carpet. I know it doesn't happen here, right? <laughs> but it happens in other churches. And so we have to make sure of these things, that they're, that they're over something really essential, that we make sure that this doesn't lead to arguments and hard feelings, that we have the love of Christ in these 
start these discussions. But finally, we need to do a motivation check. A motivation check on ourselves as siblings in Jesus. Note that both Paul and Barnabas are coming at this problem with a focus on the gospel. Yeah, they get heated. They don't handle it in the best way. But they are both coming at this wanting to do the right thing by the Lord. Each strives to get what he thinks is the best for the future of the kingdom, for the work of the gospel. Again, from Erasmus, difference of opinion is okay, provided hearts are united in their purpose to advance the gospel. From the disagreements of the apostles, God provided that the gospel should be carried even farther with the two leaders separated than if they had persevered in their original association, end quote. Paul and Barnabas' bitter, bitter argument was sinful, but their disagreement was not. Both wanted what was best for spreading God's word. Therefore, God blessed each of their ministries. Paul and his new traveling partner, Silas, they visit those established churches. They go through with Paul's original idea. They visit the established churches, encouraging them. Barnabas and John, John Mark, well, they sail to Cyprus, and they establish new churches. They spread the word. How is this possible? Well, it's possible because Paul and Barnabas both want what is best for the advancement of the kingdom. And God blesses that. God doesn't bless their argument. God doesn't bless their bitterness. But God blesses their intention to further the kingdom of God. So it is with us. In church disputes, in our Christian home disputes, are we motivated by what is best for us? Or are we motivated by what is best for God's world? Are we seeking to fulfill our own desires? Or are we seeking to fulfill the desire of Christ? Do we study the Bible well enough to know the difference? What is our motivation when we disagree? Beloved in Christ, when I first preached on this passage, oh, 15, 16 years ago, I remember asking the Reverend Phil Beck, my supervisor at the time, Phil, why is this horrible passage even in the Bible? And Phil didn't give me any straight answers until after worship, after I preached. And then he came up to me and said, you know why I think it's in there? I think it's in there because it shows us that even the greatest of church leaders are better imbeciles. Okay. But from this exchange in the Bible that seems peculiar to even have here in the Bible, there is much to learn. We learn that if we're not arguing something essential in the life of the kingdom, we ought probably let it go. We learn, second, that we are never to argue, never to become bitter in our disagreements. We disagree with kindness and compassion. And finally, third, we learn to disagree with holy, not selfish, motivations. We may not be a perfect community. We may not always be an agreeing community, but we are God's community, and we live together for the sake of God's glory, no matter what. Amen.
Nicene Creek. And for those of you gathered here, I would invite you to join me with me um, silently as we declare what we believe. And for those of you at home, you are invited to read along to declare what we believe. And so friends, let us declare what we believe. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. Amen. Friends, we have our joys and concerns that we lift up before the Lord this day. Again, we pray for Kaylee this day and for the safe delivery of her little boy. We also pray this day for Lee Seepitz, our sister in Christ, who's going in for cataract surgery on Tuesday. And so we lift her up in prayer. We pray for Ray Bowman. Uh, I know we're 10 days early here, but on March 9th, Ray will be going in for surgery as well, knee replacement surgery. And so we lift Ray up in prayer. And that is your birthday as well, isn't it? Yes. And so we also lift up prayers of blessing that day. And beloved in Christ, we lift up in prayer Carla's cousin, Mark, in Alabama. Um, he is in the hospital in the ICU suffering from COVID on, um, on a ventilator and on a special, another special machine um, to take care of him. He's in his mid-50s, if I may share. And so we lift Mark up in prayer. Friends, God is a good God. God hears our prayers. Let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, for the church throughout the world, that all who bear the name of Christ may find true repentance for their sins and walk in the ways of peace, we pray to you, O God, Lord, have mercy. For the nations of our world, wherever there is poverty, war, oppression of human spirit, that all people may repent of the evil they do to one another. We pray, O oh Lord, have mercy. For the planet Earth, God's gift to humankind, that we repent of selfish or thoughtless exploitation and tend it with care so that all may share justly in its bounty. We pray, O oh Lord, have mercy. For the leaders of the nations, that they may work for the common good of all people, that they may repent of arrogance, let us pray, O oh Lord, have mercy. For our enemies, that we may learn to love them with regard for God's compassion, forgiving wrongs, seeking reconciliation, we pray, O oh Lord, have mercy. For those who are sick or in trouble, for those we find on our prayer list, for those lifted up by word this day, for the defenseless, for the weak, for the poor, Lord, we silently pray at this time. We pray that these individuals may find help in their time of need, that the church may heed their cry. We 
you pray, O oh Lord, have mercy. Loving God, hear the prayers of your people for the sake of our world. With our prayers, accept the dedication of our lives, that we may minister to the world in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This Lenten season, we remember that Christ has given his life for us. In our tithes and in our offerings, we offer ourselves and our gifts to God. We collect our offering through the basket that Elder Mary Abbott holds um, at the exit point of the sanctuary. We also give through the Tithely app, which you can find via our website, shopchurch.org. That's where you can find a lot of information about what's going on here at the church. So we invite you to check out our website, again, shopchurch.org. Let us pray our prayer of dedication. O oh God, we have beheld your goodness to us. Accept the offering of the work of our hands and use us for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.